President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister explain why casuals employed for fewer than 12 months, local government workers, many university and non-government school workers, temporary migrant workers who can't go home, most arts and entertainment workers and many charity workers have been excluded from the JobKeeper program? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator for the question, uh, and in particular in relation to exactly why the Parliament is here today uh, to legislate this historic package by the government, $130 billion, uh, to ensure that uh, an estimated 6 million workers are connected with their employers uh, throughout the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, in relation to uh, the Senator's question, uh, because the government had to draw a line somewhere. $130 billion to almost 6 million workers will be passed by the parliament today. Uh, this is an incredible package. It has been carefully designed. It applies to, as you know, full-time workers, part-time workers, and as the uh, Minister for Industrial Relations uh, and the Minister of Finance uh, have both acknowledged in relation to the definition of casual that has been adopted for the purposes of this legislation, it is taken from the Fair Work Act. Casuals who have been in employment with their employer for a period of longer than 12 months. Uh, but, Mr President, this does not mean that the employee categories that the senator referred to are, are not recognised by the government. They are, uh, and they will be, in some circumstances, able to apply for the job seeker allowance. Uh, and this is, of course, with uh, the additional supplement that has been provided by the government in relation to COVID-19. Uh, but, Mr. President, this is an historic package that will pass the parliament today. It applies to in excess of six million Australian workers. Uh, it is a generous package, but ultimately, as, both the, as the Prime Minister, uh, the Minister for Industrial Relations, the Treasurer, and the Minister Order. for Finance. Senator Cash, time's expired. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. How many casual employees will miss out on JobKeeper program? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, Mr. President, it is not how many casual employees will miss out. It is how many casual employees are actually included in the package. Um, on, on a point of order, Senator Wong. Direct relevance. Um, I, I think, with respect to Senator Cash, having been speaking for 10 seconds, I, 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 the question is not being answered necessarily in a way that people would like. But I can't say at the moment that the way. If I could finish what I was going to say, I'll come back to you, Senator Wong. The turn of phrase I heard the minister using then was actually turning directly to JobKeeper, if I, unless I misheard, which I'm going to say I will consider to be directly relevant. Senator Wong. Mr President, the question was very simple, very precise, very pithy. How many casual employees will miss out on the JobKeeper program? The minister then says it's not a question of how many will miss out, it's a question of how many are in. With respect, Mr President, it's not consistent with your previous rulings. For you to suggest, for you to rule at this on this occasion, that such a complete mirror image of the question can possibly be directly relevant. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Cash was directly dealing with the question about job keepers, and of course, as Senator Wong well knows, the job keeper and the job seeker programs are complementary, and there is an opportunity for everybody that needs support to receive that support. On, on the point of order, um, we have always allowed ministers a moment of time to turn to a question. This question, I remind the minister, was very specific in its nature. Um, the minister has only been speaking for 10 seconds and I don't think had got quite to a full stop. I am listening very carefully to the minister um, and I will happily entertain other points of order later on in the answer if people feel that way. But at this stage, I think it's inappropriate for me to rule the minister as not being directly relevant. Senator Cash. And thank you. And as I was saying, Casuals are actually catered for if they have been in an employment relationship with their employer for longer than 12 months. In relation to the question asked by the senator, 
many casuals will still be in employment because there are a number of industries that are currently ramping up and recruiting. In terms of casuals, and as, as the Minister for Finance has acknowledged, the job keeper and job seeker programs are actually complementary. How many casuals are currently earning less than the $1,500 per fortnight? More than 50 per cent. Around 41 per cent of casual employees had been with their employer for under 12 months, as at August 2019, Order, and they Senator Cash, will not— Time for the answers expired. Senator Walsh, your final supplementary question. Thank you, President. Can the minister confirm that under the government's legislation, the Treasurer will have the power to extend JobKeeper payments to these casuals and to other excluded workers? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And I understand that uh, the Treasurer has today uh, uploaded a number of rules uh, that will be made in relation to the JobKeeper payment, um, and the Treasurer has stated um, that, and the government has actually stated at the time, um, this is an evolving situation, and uh, we continue to monitor it. But to go to your point, Senator Walsh, there are two types of payments: job keeper and job seeker. If you are not eligible for JobKeeper, then you are able to look at whether or not you will be eligible for JobSeeker. The two payments, as the Minister for Finance uh, has so eloquently pointed out, are actually complementary. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Can the minister update the Senate on further decisions and measures taken by the Morrison government to support the economy and jobs during the coronavirus-induced crisis? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator McGrath for that question. Uh, Mr President, the COVID-19 crisis is a battle that we are fighting on two fronts. It is both a health battle and an economic battle. Our health mission, uh, as we've discussed, is to slow down the spread of the virus to save lives. Uh, I can inform the Senate today that the early signs are promising. Official data shows that we are heading in the right direction in terms of slowing the spread of the virus, uh, with the growth in new cases going from uh, above 20 per cent when we last met to uh, just uh, 2 per cent in more recent days. But, uh, Mr. President, the government's economic mission is to keep businesses in business and as many Australians as possible working for those businesses uh, in their jobs. To date, our support for the economy has totaled $320 billion, or 16.4 per cent of GDP. We have doubled support for welfare recipients and provided greater support for Social Security and veteran income support recipients and eligible concession card holders. And indeed, I mean, for those casuals, who have been uh, in employment with the same employer for less than 12 months, uh, if they lose their job or um, you know, need that support, they are able to apply for the job seeker payment, which we have doubled, we have, which we have doubled compared to what was there before. Uh, individuals in financial distress because of the uh, coronavirus crisis can access part of the superannuation uh, to relieve financial strain. Retirees have more flexibility to manage their superannuation assets and lower deeming rights are helping those under financial pressure. Eligible small and medium-sized businesses have received a boost to their cash flow and now have easier access to new loans. Mr. President, rent relief is on the way for commercial and residential tenants, while business continuity payments are keeping childcare services afloat. The economic battlefront is the one Order. we have come Senator to continue Cormann. to deal with today. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you, yes. Can the minister inform the Senate how Australian businesses and workers will benefit from the government's JobKeeper program? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McGrath for that supplementary. Yes, I can. Uh, the JobKeeper payments um, is designed uh, to help keep as many businesses as possible in business and to help keep as many Australians as possible working for those businesses uh, in their jobs. It is paid to the employer to reduce their payroll pressures, given a significant impact to their turnover, so they can keep employees in a job rather than uh, having to let them go. The historic wage subsidy will be delivered to around 6 million Australians, just under half uh, our working population, who will receive a flat payment of $1,500 per fortnight through their employee before tax. 
This $130 billion JobKeeper package will help keep Australians in job, jobs as well as tackle the significant economic impact from the coronavirus. The payment will provide the equivalent of around 70% of the national medium wage and indeed for workers in the accommodation, hospitality and retail sectors it will equate to a full medium Senator replacement Corbett. wage. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Minister, why is the JobKeeper payment so important to building a bridge to the economic recovery for the Australian economy on the other side of the pandemic? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McGrath for that supplementary question. Mr President, it is vital that through these challenging times, employers and employees stay connected uh, as much as is possible. Uh, this payment will ensure this uh, can be the case, even while many businesses move into hibernation because uh, their areas of activity have been impacted by the coronavirus crisis or they've been asked to restrict their activities uh, on the basis of medical advice. The JobKeeper payment is about enabling businesses to keep their workers engaged so that they're ready uh, when we come out of this crisis on the other side. Businesses must be in the best possible position to rebuild and recover, and the most important part of that will be having workers still attached to their businesses. Uh, Mr. President, the $130 billion JobKeeper package is unprecedented in our history. It is designed to get this country through an unprecedented challenge and places in the best possible position on the other side of this uh, pandemic. Senator Sheldon. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister confirm that those whose partners earn over $78,000 a year, New Zealanders who are permanently living in Australia and temporary visa holders are not eligible for JobSeeker? What is the government's plan for those that are, who are at risk of falling through the cracks as a result of not being eligible to either JobKeeper and job seeker. The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Sheldon, for your question. Um, the government has announced over previous weeks, and today we come to this place again with another um, package so that we can assist as many Australians as possible to be able to get to the other side of what is an unprecedented crisis. We are absolutely focused in the first instance uh, with our first package, which came out, which was the Job Seeker package and the Corona Supplement, to make sure that we address the concerns and the, and the, the, uh, the impact on those that are the most vulnerable in our society, those people who find themselves without income. Today, obviously, we have another significant package, probably the biggest package uh, that this parliament will ever ever have to, uh, to address. Well, hopefully we would never have to be in a position again to address a package the size of $130 billion, which will look to add on top of the previous two packages to support another group of Australians who have been impacted by the coronavirus. Um, so today, um, as we did when we were here last time, as we did before the parliament got up, uh, this government continues to put in place a range of different measures to make sure that a broad range of Senator Australians. Watt. Sorry, Senator um, Watt, on a point of order? On relevance, Mr. President, again, we've got a minister refusing to answer the question as to whether particular categories of workers are not eligible for job seeker. We don't need another well, Senator Watt, speech about we, how great we, the government was, is. We'd just like an answer to well, our Senator question. Watt, that was the first part of the question. The second part of the question was somewhat broader, which I commenced with what is the government's plan with respect. Um, well, I'm listening, and I, I, I'm listening to a description of... There, there, can I, I, you know, I'm going to finish. I was going to say, I'm listening to the minister. Um, the second part of the question was more broadly worded. Today we do have an opportunity for debating the nature of answers to questions after question time. Senator Wong, you were seeking the call. With respect, Mr. President, um, the word plan doesn't exist you know, on its own. The word plan in the, in the question referred directly to those who are not eligible for either job keeper or job seeker. So my uh, submission um, is yeah. that direct relevance goes to what the word, the way in which the word plan is used. The ministers can't just pick a word no, and I'm extrapolate just... it from the circumstances. No, I, I take the point. The minute the question was, what is the government's plan for those? The, the question claimed falling through the cracks, I believe the phrase was used. I'm listening to the minister um, who is addressing a range of issues. I think that question was by its nature broad. There's an opportunity to debate the nature of answers after question time and what senators think of the nature of those answers. But I'll continue to listen very carefully to the minister. She's now been reminded of it twice. 
Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and as I was uh, trying to point out to, to those opposite, the, the, the measures that have been put in place are, are extremely comprehensive and seek to address the concerns that are raised about people who find themselves in particular circumstances. Uh, and that, in the first instance, had, with our changes to the job seeker payments and the corona supplement, was about dealing with people who did not have a job. Um, we also, I note that you raised the issue in relation to, to visas uh, and those people that are in Australia who have, do, not, do not have um, direct access to benefits. Um, there are a number of measures that have been put in place, but particularly one that I would draw your attention to is the ability for those that are in Australia who have work rights as part of their visas, the ability for them to be able to access their superannuation. If Order. not, they are Senator welcome Ruskell, to go home. The answer is expired. Senator Sheldon, oh, supplementary yeah. question. Have you sought or received advice on, about how to assist those who fall through the cracks? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. And, and um, as I said, this is a very comprehensive package, um, and today is just one part of that package. Um, but there are a number of measures that have been put in place. I've mentioned a few of them in the, in the answer to the first question that was asked by Senator Sheldon. But in addition to that, uh, as part of my portfolio responsibility, uh, I am working with emergency relief providers, with food relief providers, with financial counsellors, to make sure that where people find themselves in a position where they really uh, they have no access. Um, um, to be able to get uh, um, you know, uh, assistance because they've chosen to stay in Australia, um, then we have a very comprehensive emergency relief response, uh, which I'd be more than delighted to run through uh, the components. It's a $200 million package which is focused almost entirely on the provision of day-to-day -day emergency relief, things like food, the payment of bills, access to cash, to make sure that those people in Australia who require this emergency relief will be able to get access to Order. it. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Well, the parliament has voted to provide the minister with expansive powers to vary thresholds for welfare payments to ensure that all those that will need support during this unprecedented crisis will receive it. When will the minister use those powers? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Sheldon. And as you rightly point out, and I think Senator Wong raised uh, the matter in her remarks uh, to Senator Cormann's um, ministerial statement, yes, I do have the power um, to be able to make changes to various cohorts, and, and this includes visa categories, should the need arise. At the moment, we're obviously <coughs> monitoring very closely uh, the impact of the coronavirus as it continues to have an impact across the whole of the Australian economy. Uh, we are responding, uh, and I think we're responding very quickly and appropriately, um, as I mentioned, in response to the concerns that were raised about visa holders in Australia who had work rights, the ability for them to be able to get access to their superannuation gives them the immediate opportunity to be able to get access to finance to support themselves. So, um, in response to your direct question, uh, Senator Sheldon, um, I do have those powers. I will continue to monitor the situation along with my colleagues, and should the need arise, those powers will be enacted. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Minister, can you please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting Australian primary producers to get their high-value products overseas despite the decrease in flights due to the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank Senator Brockman for uh, his question and his, uh, his ever vigilant, determined advocacy on behalf of, uh, of Australia's exporters. Uh, the decisions that, uh, that the Morrison government has been taking to protect lives, Mr. President, do sadly, in many of their applications, threaten livelihoods. Not just livelihoods, but also the very viability of some businesses. Uh, those threats place at risk jobs today and, indeed, jobs in the future, even when the recovery comes. And that's why we've been taking extraordinary decisions to seek to support Australian business and their employees through these tough times. The JobKeeper allowance and a number of other measures. And in my portfolio, we took the extraordinary decision last week to support a new international freight mechanism. Now, this $110 million mechanism is going to support our primary producers, our farmers, our fishers, uh, to be able to continue to access the markets where their goods so often head to. Australia produces enough food to support more than 70 million people, uh, close to three times our population, and our export markets are crucial destinations for that. 
Uh, there is still demand in those markets. There's still production from our farmers and fishers, but they have been crippled by the collapse of international aviation in terms of their capacity to get to those markets. Our $110 million freight mechanism is going to help them to be able to reach those markets once again. And we're standing this up incredibly quickly, thanks to the appointment of the uh, Coordinator General for Freight, uh, Michael Byrne, one of Australia's most experienced logistics professionals. And indeed, in the next couple of days, I expect the first flight uh, to depart Hobart, packed full of Tasmanian salmon uh, produced uh, by, uh, by company Tassel, uh, headed into uh, Asian markets. Similarly, I expect shortly thereafter we'll see from Senator Brockman's home state a flight headed out of Perth, again carrying premium seafood, ensuring we protect those Australian businesses and, most importantly, the jobs of the Australians who rely upon Order. them. Order. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how, the, how industry has reacted to the International Freight Assistance Mechanism package? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, this isn't a free ride for industry. They still have to pay traditional commercial rates. Uh, indeed, they'll pay those rates at a premium. But they have warmly welcomed the fact the government has stepped up with a solution and a solution to ensure that freight access is both reliable and affordable for them. Indeed, the Gerald and Fisherman's Cooperative, no doubt somebody Senator Brockman is familiar with, uh, said that if we couldn't find a solution, we would have been stopping our boats and standing down our entire workforce. This action is helping to save many of those jobs. The Red Meat Advisory Council acknowledged that the continuity and affordability of air export capacity to our valued and high-end export markets is critical. And the seafood industry of Australia said that this marks the beginning of a return to normal. And perhaps most appropriately, they acknowledged and said, there's no better stimulus than getting back to work. That's what this is all about, Mr President, ensuring that we support Australians who can to stay in their jobs and businesses who can Order. to stay afloat. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the government also boosting ca cash flow for exporters through the Export Market Development Grant Scheme? Senator Birmingham. Our internationally exposed businesses were some of the first to feel the impacts of COVID-19, as many of our large international export destinations uh, shut down parts of their economies uh, before the domestic impact was felt here in Australia. So knowing that they were the first to feel the pain, we've put in place additional measures uh, to support them. The government's injected an additional $49.8 million into the Export Market Development Grants program, recognising that businesses who had invested in good faith in seeking to grow export markets are unlikely to yield dividends from those export markets this year. Now, since making that announcement just last week, we have ensured that $44 million has already flowed to almost 1,000 exporters. Another example of the government using existing mechanisms where we can to be able to deliver quick, effective support to those who need it. Now, this will help not just our goods exporters, but many across the services sector in arts, education and tourism. And in the tourism space, I particularly acknowledge those many regional tourism businesses who are doing such a good job as well of sending out a Order. clear message Senator telling Birmingham, Australians to stay home for the this answer Easter. answer has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate and relates to oversight. The British Parliament is sitting. Both the British uh, Government and parliamentary authorities have been clear that they have no plans to shut uh, Parliament and would prefer to avoid this course of action. Speaking in the Commons on 16 March, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, stated, I think the whole House will be sure in our collective decisions that although Parliament may have to operate different, differently, it must remain open. The US Congress is sitting. The Italian Senate and the Spanish Cortes is sitting. Uh, despite uh, its coronavirus committee, the New Zealand Parliament resumes on the 28th of April with modified processes and procedures. The only parliaments I am aware of that have adjourned in the manner uh, the government is proposing tonight are those of the legislatures of Mexico, South Africa and San Marino. Why is the government seeking to suspend our parliament? The Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, I, I have addressed this in my ministerial statement, but what, what I would say, and I'm, I'm trying to be as diplomatic as I possibly can be here, I mean, we are taking an Australian path to protect and save Australian lives by taking very drastic measures to 
uh, stop or to slow down the spread of this virus. When we closed our borders or when we imposed border restrictions to return travelers from uh, mainland China and Wuhan province in particular, uh, a number of these other European and other countries that uh, the Senator has referenced did not take that course of action. And it took much longer in an Australian context for the spread to accelerate somewhat than what it did in places like Italy, Spain, Germany, France, the UK. Um, I mean, you know, I, I believe that the actions that we are taking in Australia are being successful in saving lives by slowing the spread. And all Australians are being given very strict instructions, uh, imposing restrictions on their travel, on um, encouragement to stay at home, work from home where that is possible. And yes, we do have a job to do, and where we must and where we need to, we should come together and we can. There's a mechanism in place to help ensure that happens. But to the greatest extent possible, we should also comply uh, with the restrictions imposed on Australians. And we, sh we are a large continent. The logistics involved in bringing the Parliament together uh, are, are very uh, significant with lots of people coming from all corners of Australia. And in fact, you'll find that health and police authorities around Australia would actually regard federal politicians as one of the comparatively higher risk categories when it comes to the spread of the coronavirus. Now, we, we have a job to do. We, um, you know, state laws can't interfere with the uh, exercise of, uh, you know, obviously uh, our federal parliamentary privilege. But nevertheless, uh, we should, to the greatest extent possible, comply with the public health advice and instructions that are imposed on Order, all other Senator Australians. Corman. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, uh, truck, bus and train drivers are doing their job. Journalists are doing their job. Factory workers are doing their job. Despite the risks, teachers, nurses and doctors are doing their job. Chefs, supermarket workers, public servants, police, aged care workers, ADF personnel are doing their jobs, some of them in ships. Miners are doing their job. Uh, everyone who can is doing their job. Why is the government proposing that senators don't do their job? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. That is not what the government is proposing. Uh, I believe that every single senator in this chamber is doing their job. Uh, whether the Senate meets in Canberra and whether we bring every single senator from uh, around the country to Canberra uh, in the context of uh, state border uh, closures in most states and indeed in the Northern Territory, uh, we will of course continue to do our job serving the Australian people and senators will continue to have the opportunity to hold the government to account. Uh, not, I mean, not only through our normal mechanisms, but also, of course, uh, through the Senate Select Committee uh, that uh, we are about to establish uh, later this afternoon. So I completely reject the premise of the question, which suggests that somehow uh, members of parliament, members of federal parliament, and senators in particular, are not going to continue to do their job. The government continues to do their job. Uh, all senators will continue to do their job. In fact, uh, I would suggest that many of us uh, are working much harder than we ever have uh, during this period. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. A Senate, uh, thank you, Mr. President. A Senate Select Committee can be obstructed by comedy principles. That means that it can't call the Minister for Health, uh, the attorney in his capacity as Industrial Relations Minister, or the Treasurer. Will the government commit to requiring these ministers to appear before the Select Committee should such a request be made? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think that uh, the Senator has just asked me a hypothetical question because I don't believe that the committee uh, has even been constituted yet and certainly hasn't made a decision yet on who uh, it may or may not want to appear. Uh, what I would say is that my expectation would be that that committee would operate in the usual way, uh, in the way that Senate committees and Senate select committees have operated uh, since Federation. And uh, the government will, of course, support the work of the committee. And, uh, all of the agencies and departments and all of the officials that are involved in the government's response uh, will make themselves available in the usual way to support the work of the committee. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister advise the Senate what the Australian government is doing to help Australians overseas to return home? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Smith uh, for his question. Uh, Australian officials continue to work around the clock, literally, to uh, help Australians overseas to return. This has been particularly challenging in areas where there are travel restrictions and where scheduled commercial flights have abruptly ended. And I want to today take this opportunity to acknowledge the efforts of those uh, diplomatic uh, and DFAT officials here and overseas. 
We're establishing a backbone, if you like, for international travel for Australians by working with both Qantas and Virgin to ensure that they can continue regular flights to four key transport hubs, to London, to Los Angeles, to Hong Kong and to Auckland, uh, important for passengers and also important for freight. The government is providing direct support to ensure our two major international airlines can continue these services. We're also coordinating closely with other governments to identify commercial means that continue to exist for Australians to return. Uh, in Cambodia, for example, uh, our embassy is currently finalising negotiations for a special commercial flight from Phnom Penh to Australia. Uh, we have had a very good response from Australians registered uh, for this flight and all things going uh, well, Mr President, and, uh, and I say that in the context of current events, that flight should occur this weekend. We're talking to Qantas about other special flights to assist Australians who have found themselves in countries that declared sudden border closures. I'd like to emphasise that we are working constantly with other governments, with cruise companies, with airlines, and harnessing those key relationships to get the most out of the existing global transport network. We know that many Australians need assistance right now, both overseas and at home, indeed. And this approach that the government is taking fits with our broader responsibilities as a government to support Australians. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise what steps the government has taken to both support and arrange flights to return Australians from international locations? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much. And again, I thank Senator Smith for uh, the question. The government has already uh, supported and facilitated commercial flights for hundreds of Australians to return home safely, including uh, from Uruguay, from Nepal and from Peru. Uh, in the case of Peru and Uruguay, most recently, uh, we've supported the travel company, Chimu Adventures, through underwriting and indemnity to ensure that the flights could go ahead. We're supporting a further commercial flight by LATAM from Peru tomorrow uh, for passengers out of Lima, Cusco and Iquitos. Uh, also joining up other Australians which were in more remote parts of Peru uh, in terms of arranging transport to assist them to, uh, to reach that flight. We have had a very good outcome uh, in Nepal where our ambassador, Peter Budd, worked closely with authorities in Kathmandu and Nepal Airlines to facilitate a commercial flight that brought over 260 Australians and New Zealanders into Brisbane last week. Uh, I thanked my Nepali counterpart uh, personally on Monday uh, for that effort, which included bringing passengers to Kathmandu Order. from places Senator like Payne. Lukra, Pokhara Time and Chitwa. The answer has expired. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate of the progress in helping Australians who are on cruise ships to disembark and return home to Australia? Senator Payne. Uh, thank the Senator very much for the uh, question in relation to cruise ships. Uh, since the 14th of uh, last month, the government has uh, assisted in more than 6,400 Australians disembarking and returning to Australia from 45 cruise ships uh, across the world multiple charter and commercial flights. I want to thank the cruise industry and acknowledge their cooperation and their work in uh, that outcome. To give a few examples, uh, over 200 Australians arrived from the United States yesterday after disembarking the Zandam, the Rotterdam and the Coral Princess cruise ships. More than 260 Australians from the Costa Luminosa, the Costa Victoria, arrived in Perth from Italy on the 30th of March. And of course, today, 288 Australians who had been on the Norwegian Jewel have now finished their 14 day quarantine after returning to Australia. These uh, outcomes have required significant amounts of uh, patient diplomacy from DFAT. And again, I thank those officials from uh, the Department of Foreign Order. Affairs and Senator Trade Payne. for managing Time these highly the complex has operations. Expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government, Minister Cormann, uh, representing the Prime Minister, about some of the people left behind in the government's COVID support packages. The government has bent over backwards to ensure that commercial tenancies can be renegotiated to continue, but why have you continually pushed residential tenants to the bottom of the national cabinet agenda? Where is the action on the earlier commitment to prevent uh, residential evictions? And with half a million young casual workers getting no support from JobKeeper, how do you expect them to cover rent? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, we are providing a, a significantly enhanced social safety net through the Job Seeker program, and we are uh, about to legislate a $130 billion Job Keeper 
program. Beyond that, we do recognize uh, the challenges that many uh, tenants in residential tenancy face, uh, tenancies face, of course. Uh, and the uh, issue of tenancy is fairly and squarely a matter for state and territory governments, which they recognise. Senator <coughs> Waters, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. The industries that have been most affected are the same industries that have the highest numbers of casuals employed for less than 12 months. Hospitality, retail, accommodation, tourism and the arts and entertainment industries. We're talking here about one million people, with half a million of those under the age of 24. Why did you exclude them? Was it just budget-saving reasons or because young people don't vote for your party? Senator Cormann. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll ask the minister. The minister has silence, so he can continue or commence his answer. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Let me just uh, firstly utterly reject the offensive suggestion that any partisan or electoral considerations are involved in any of this. I mean, that is just objectionable. And it's, it's very disappointing that you would choose to lower the tone uh, of uh, the national conversation in this context to that extent. You've raised some legitimate uh, issues of inquiries and, and you let yourself down, quite frankly, uh, by adding that snarky little bit at the end. Uh, and you, you should reflect on that. You should reflect on that. Now, Mr. Uh, President, uh, we are providing uh, JobKeeper support to six million Australians. Uh, we will be uh, providing um, job seeker support to well over a million Australians. I mean, more than half the Australian working population will be on some form of government payment to support them through this crisis. And um, yes, I mean, we did use the uh, casual worker, the long-term casual worker definition out of the Fair Work Act. We do, I mean, the whole objective is to keep workers connected to the business that they have an employment relationship with. Uh, and uh, the definition of an employment relationship for casual workers is that they've worked <coughs> for that business uh, for at least 12 months. But it's not as if uh, casual um, workers who have worked for that for order. a business for Senator less time Coleman. can't get access Senator, to anything. I didn't think I'd need the standing orders today, but can I remind senators of Standing Order 73, which says that questions shall not contain imputations, amongst other things? I would say that was getting a bit too specific, Senator Waters. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. The increased costs for disabled people and carers as a result of needing to self-isolate are greater than the general population. Private transport, food deliveries, health care and personal protective equipment are all basic needs now. Will you extend the coronavirus supplement to DSP and carer payment recipients to acknowledge their higher living costs and not leave them behind? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, the uh, Minister for Social Services just uh, confirmed for me that uh, pensioners are already on the highest uh, income support payment. And on top of that, of course, we are making two uh, $750 uh, additional contributions, uh, one in this uh, which has gone out from the end of March uh, to the middle of April, and the second one which uh, will go out in July. Uh, so we, we are recognising that there are additional uh, challenges, of course, which is why we've made these additional contributions. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is protecting and supporting rural and regional Australians through the coronavirus pandemic? Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator McKenzie for the question and acknowledge her deep commitment to those in rural and regional Australia. Uh, Senator McKenzie, as you, as you would know, uh, we are supporting our rural and regional Australians affected by the COVID-19 uh, crisis with a $1 billion recovery and relief fund. Uh, Senator McKenzie, to confirm the words of you have used, we are in this together regional Australia is not immune. Uh, Mr President, the Liberal and National Governments will provide fast, targeted support through our Relief and Recovery Fund to address emerging needs of specifically affected sectors, industries and communities, and to immediately reduce pressures in regional Australia. This includes further support under the Regional Air Assistance Package to maintain air network, uh, to maintain the air network across regional Australia, support for the agricultural and fisheries sector, 
to continue export of their high-quality produce into overseas markets, complemented by the waiving of fisheries levies for Commonwealth fishers. Uh, we also know that disruption to labour supply uh, and the agricultural food supply chain have been key issues for the agricultural sector uh, in managing the effects of COVID-19. And We're committed to ensuring agriculture is well supported and Australia remains in a position to produce the food we need and continue to provide food for the world. We're also responding uh, to calls from farmers across the country. And, uh, as Senator Mackenzie has already alluded to and referred to, we have made temporary visa changes to allow those in the Pacific Labor Scheme and seasonal worker program uh, and working holiday makers to continue working in agriculture uh, and food processing. We are also keeping regional Australians connected with the changes to how schooling and work is being carried out during this crisis. We have new initiatives from NBNCO that will provide more broadband data for SkyMuster satellite customers living in rural and remote Australia. And Senator McKenzie, we also have, as you know, our $2.4 billion dollar health package. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Uh, can the minister advise how these measures add to our government's other support initiatives for regional communities affected by bushfire and drought? Senator Cash. Uh, well, yes, I can. And despite the current crisis, our government stands with drought and bushfire-affected regional communities. Uh, again, Senator McKenzie, as you know, we have not forgotten them. There are a range of programs available to immediately support those affected by the drought conditions, including the Farm Household Allowance, which gives farming families the assistance they need to put food on the table, and has recently been given a boost due to the government's COVID-19 supplement. We also have the recently expanded Rural Financial Counselling Services, the Drought Community Support Initiative, uh, Mental Health and Wellbeing Support has been boosted, and concessional loans and generous taxation measures continue to be available. Uh, we also know the drought just doesn't stop at the farm gate, which is why there is also a range of programs for communities doing it tough. The Drought Communities Program, which gives a $1 million stimulus to councils, which can then allow them to boost tourism or provide additional employment through infrastructure projects. Um, there is also additional funding for road infrastructure and more support available Order. for Senator schools Cash. and childcare Time centres the answer that have taken has expired. a Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Minister, what advice is there on how we can best support rural and regional Australians during the pandemic, including in relation to travel this coming Easter? Senator Cash. Well, Senator McKenzie, you actually raise a very good point, and you've already referred to it in your ministerial statement. It's been sent out uh, via australia.gov.au, and many of us will have received it on our mobile telephones. And that is, of course, this Easter, over that holiday break, the message is clear. Stay at home. Don't travel to the coast. Don't travel to the country over Easter. Don't go and visit family and friends in the regions or your favourite holiday destination this season. You may think you are doing the right thing, but you will not be. Continue doing what you've been doing for the past few weeks. Stay at home. That, Mr President, is what is going to see us all collectively uh, as a nation through this crisis. At this time, as Senator McKenzie acknowledged, uh, regional Australia they need our support, but the support we can give them over the Easter long weekend is to stay at home. So the message Order, is clear: Senator stay Cash. at home. Time don't for travel. the answer has expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. The Biosecurity Act of 2015 requires cruise vessels to report any passengers who show symptoms of infectious diseases to the Department of Agriculture biosecurity officers before arrival in Australia. According to a COVID-19 fact sheet titled Information for the Cruise Industry released by the Australian government on 6 March, if an ill traveller is reported, quote, a biosecurity officer will liaise with the vessel to screen for COVID-19. The Ruby Princess reported 158 ill passengers, including 17 with high fevers. How many federal biosecurity officers met the Ruby Princess's 2,700 passengers when it docked in Sydney on 17 March, and what actions did these officers take to screen for COVID-19? 
The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Keneally for her question. In relation to the specific questions that you've asked, I will take those on notice and we'll get you an answer from the Minister for Agriculture. Um, but can I absolutely assure the Chamber that the Australian Government is totally committed to protecting Australians from COVID-19? Uh, and that includes through its biosecurity measures that operate through the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, and that we are working very closely with the Department of Health, which is obviously leading the national health response uh, to COVID-19. But as you rightly point out, biosecurity plays an extraordinarily critical role, uh, particularly at our borders, uh, to make sure that we continue to protect Australian citizens, because as we all know, uh, much of the identified um, transmission of COVID-19 has come from overseas. Um, as of 1 February 2020, all travellers arriving from or who have been in mainland China, um, have, uh, regardless of nationality, have been subject to control measures, and subsequent to that time, um, other countries have also been subject to control measures, as we have seen in recent days when those um, who have been brought home by the extraordinary work of the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, and Trade through the, the work of, of Minister Payne to bring Australians home uh, to Australia. So uh, I thank the Senator for her question and I will get the details of your question on notice. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. The same COVID-19 fact sheet states that disembarking cruise ship passengers with no signs or symptoms of COVID-19 must, quote, wear a surgical mask when travelling domestically or on public transport or taxis in Australia to reach their home. Did federal biosecurity officers direct the 2,700 disembarking passengers from the Ruby Princess to wear a surgical mask to travel home? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President, and once again, thanks, Senator Keneally, for her question uh, and continued interest. Um, I will take the specific nature of your question on notice, and I will make sure that I provide you with a very timely response. But you know, there is absolutely no doubt, Mr. President, that um, cruise ships have posed a very unique uh, issue to manage during the COVID uh, pandemic, whether it's cruise ships in Australia or Australians on cruise ships that have been around the world. Um, obviously, we took very strong action to ban international cruise vessels from docking in Australia some weeks ago. Um, however, however, we have had uh, some vessels that were already on their way here um, and that, that, that ban to make sure that the Australians that are on board many of these vessels um, are protected and also to make sure that we can continue to protect Australians uh, from this disease that is ravaging the world and where Australia has been working extremely hard to make sure that our transmission levels have been kept at the absolute lowest through the very strong management of, uh, Order. of the measures Senator in Rustin. Australia. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. The Prime Minister said on 15 March, quote, the Australian government will also ban cruise ships from foreign ports from arriving at Australian ports. On 19 March, the Ruby Princess arrived and disembarked 2,700 passengers. That ship is now linked to 600 COVID-19 cases, 13 deaths and 19 cases of community transmission in Australia. Does the government take any responsibility for failing to stop the one ship that mattered? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Senator Keneally, for her follow-up question. Um, can I um, say that First of all, there is an investigation obviously being undertaken around this particular ship that you refer to, and it would be inappropriate for me to make any comment. I have already undertaken to take on any specifics of the questions that you've asked on notice, but can I also um, take the opportunity um, to acknowledge that there are a number of people um, who have some very tragic circumstances on the Ruby Princess and to um, express our condolences to the families of those people? Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Morrison government is protecting and supporting individual Australians who are being impacted by the economic downturn caused by the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Scar, for the opportunity to be able to inform uh, this place of some of the most important legislation and changes um, to our uh, work environment, our social services system, but also the uh, the impact of the changes that will hopefully pay pass through today in this place. And, and I acknowledge that the uh, the acknowledgement of those in this place that these measures will pass with the $130 billion uh, job keeper payment which is a support to businesses and to workers to make sure that they remain connected. 
through what is an absolutely unprecedented situation that we find ourselves in in Australia. But equally, um, Senator Scarr, um, if those people who are not uh, eligible for the JobKeeper payment, um, Australians who uh, are unable to access their payment will, uh, in many instances, in most instances, be able to access the job seeker payment. Because we've, we have moved very quickly to supercharge our social security system to make sure that Australians who have lost their jobs as a result of the coronavirus will be able to get quick and easy access to support to get them through. Um, this very, very quick but time-limited response uh, is supported by the coronavirus supplement, which is a $550 uh, per fortnight uh, increase in the amount of money that people are able to receive uh, when they are on job seeker payment. And this has also been extended out uh, to youth allowance, to parenting payments, to farm household allowance and to special benefits and also to students. Um, and anybody who is eligible for the, for the base payment will receive the $550 a fortnight um, supplement. But in addition to that, there are a number of things that have changed, including the waiving of many of the conditions for access to make sure that many people who would not otherwise be able to get access to this payment will be able to. This includes changing eligibility, waiving waiting periods and also asset testing, um, both liquid assets and other asset testing. So, I want to Order, assure Senator everyone. Rustin. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, Mr. President, I thank the Minister. What is the government doing to support the most vulnerable people outside of the welfare system, including in my home state of Queensland? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much. Um, the government has made a commitment in recent days of an additional $200 million to go towards emergency relief. This urgent funding will be distributed through a very complex uh, and uh, comprehensive uh, charities network that works around Australia. And can I um, say a huge thank you to our emergency relief providers, uh, to our food relief providers, to our financial counsellors and those people that have, have taken on this enormous role. Um, you know, the Red Crosses, the Salvation Army, um, the St Vincent de Paul's, um, the Anglicare, the Uniting Care, Wesley Mission, I could go on all day. The amount of amazing organisations that are out there supporting vulnerable Australians uh, with, uh, and, and also, at the same time, administering the additional $200 million that we have made available uh, to support them. Uh, emergency relief and food relief remain an absolute priority for this government to make sure that people have got access to the things that absolutely basic things that they need uh, for Order, everyday Senator life. Senator Rustin. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Mr President, how is the government helping aged pensioners and other vulnerable cohorts through these challenging times? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, as, uh, as has been mentioned um, before, this very comprehensive group of packages that have been put through this place to assist Australians as they um, face uh, the, the consequences of the catastrophic impact of, uh, of the coronavirus, one such of those measures has been uh, an additional $750. Uh, payment, which I, um, most Australians who are eligible, the, the six and a half million Australians who were eligible for the first payment, uh, most of them would have already received. In fact, my understanding is uh, nearly $5 billion has already gone out the door in the last week to people who were eligible for the $750 uh, um, payment. In addition to that, there will be another $750 payment made to the same group of people with the exclusion of those that now will be able to access the COVID uh, supplement. So this will include aged pensioners, carers, um, those people on family tax benefits, disability uh, pensioners, uh, veterans and the like. Uh, this will Order, be paid Senator Rustin. Senator Wall. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Through no fault of their own, many Australians are stranded overseas, unable to follow the advice of the government to return home, as governments abroad have implemented lockdowns and commercial options for flights have dried up. Germany has arranged some 170 flights. The UK has partnered with airlines to re repatriate its citizens, and Canada has organised well over a dozen flights from different locations. The Australian government's communications to Australians on the ground say, and I quote, the Australian government's policy precludes assisted departures. Why is the government ruling out assisted departures to get Australians home to safety? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and uh, I uh, thank Senator Wong for her question. I think it is very, very important to be quite clear about this, because the government has made our position very clear that we are considering, on a case-by-case -case basis, 
supporting our airlines to, to operate non-scheduled services to less central locations to bring Australians home. That we will do that where it is feasible, where all other commercial options have been exhausted and where local authorities will permit such flights. Uh, and the last uh, factor, uh, Mr President, uh, is particularly uh, relevant as well. So we don't have plans for assisted departures in the context in which uh, we, for example, conducted flights to the, what was then the epicentre of the COVID-19 outbreak, Wuhan uh, in China, and then secondly for, to Japan, because those flights were unique and complex. Medical exercises to the epicentres of the virus at the beginning of this crisis to Wuhan. The situation of, the, of, of Australians at the moment is quite different from that, Mr President, and I have uh, been through that uh, in, in context in the chamber today and on many other occasions. So do, we are considering, on a case-by-case -case basis, supporting our airlines to operate non-scheduled services to less central locations to bring Australians home. And some of those uh, decision-making processes in uh, parts of South America uh, and in other uh, countries, Mr. President, are well underway. What we have also done, as I uh, explained to the Senate in response to uh, Senator Smith's excellent question, uh, in places like Nepal, where we have been able to work with a commercial operator, uh, we have brought Australians from very remote parts of Nepal, from Pokhara, from Chitwan, from Lukla, for example, to Kathmandu to make sure that we could put as many Australians as possible on that flight and New Zealanders Order. to Senator bring them Payne. to Australia. Senator Wong, supplementary question. Uh, while the UK government ensured their citizens could come home from Peru for some £250, Australians in Peru were forced to pay $5,000 for a privately arranged charter option. And Australians are being surveyed by this government about how much they would be willing to pay to be repatriated to safety. Does the government agree that cost should not be a barrier to Australians getting home safely? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Every single one of these cases, Mr. President, is different. Uh, every single country has different circumstances. Every single flight is different. Uh, in some, they are able to be commercial flights uh, on scheduled, uh, scheduled uh, arrangements. In some, they are charters. Uh, in others, they are a commercial venture, which was uh, the one that Senator Wong referred to, organised by Chimu Travel, not by the government but by Chimu Travel, uh, which was in fact supported by the government uh, so that it was able to occur. Uh, we provided uh, uh, important uh, uh, indemnity and underwriting for that flight and for the flight of Australians from the Ocean Atlantic in Montevideo, which was also organised by Chimu Travel. But every single one of those uh, is the same. Uh, we have not been involved in setting up uh, those, uh, those prices, Mr President. So, although there are Australians literally everywhere, we are endeavouring to work Order. with uh, Senator those. Senator Payne, time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. As more time passes, health systems overseas are becoming more stretched, and the situation in some locations is deteriorating. There are reports to my office that locals are arming themselves in some locations to prevent foreigners leaving their accommodation. Will the minister commit to providing assistant departures where this is necessary to get Australians to safety? Senator Payne. So, Mr. President, uh, I, I think that uh, it is perhaps a question of nomenclature more than anything else that uh, Senator Wong is, is, is raising. I think that we are talking about doing flights on a case by case basis, as I have clearly outlined to the Senate, uh, and as uh, will support Australians to return home. Uh, and indeed, I have also outlined the many Australians who have been able to return home in recent uh, weeks. The government has been explicitly clear in relation to, uh, to our travel advice, and I think that that is also uh, a very important aspect of the information we have provided to Australians consistently indeed since the 9th of March, when, for example, we advised Australians to reconsider taking a cruise at that time. On the 13th of March, advising all Australians to reconsider the need to travel overseas. On the 17th of March, advising Australians overseas who wanted to return home to do so as soon as possible. On the 18th of March, raising our Order, travel advice Senator to Payne. level four of four, do time not travel. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. 
Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Liberals and Nationals in government are protecting Australians and responding to the global coronavirus pandemic? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Mr. President, and I thank Senator Davey for the question. Uh, Mr. President, in Australia, as at 10:30 a.m. this morning, there have been 5,977 confirmed cases of the coronavirus, and sadly, as at 6:30 a.m. this morning, there have now been 49 deaths. Globally, we have seen over 1.4 million confirmed cases and over 81,865 lives have now been lost. Our priority as a government is to flatten the curve and to reduce the number of cases. Australia's health emergency responses are flexible and they are scalable in order that we can respond effectively to the evolving situation. We are well placed to respond to ill travellers and those at risk of contracting infection with border isolation, surveillance and contact tracing mechanisms already in place. We have one of the world's leading testing programs with just over 313 tests conducted in Australia, one of the highest per capita rates of testing in the world. The National Cabinet, on receipt of the expert medical advice, is continuing to coordinate a national response, working with the states and territories. We have taken further steps to enforce social distancing measures implemented further travel restrictions to prevent the spread of the virus, and we have more than 220 fever clinics up and running around the country. The rates of new cases in Australia have been declining over the past few weeks, which is an encouraging sign. However, as we all know, now is not the time for complacency, and Australians must continue to practice social distancing measures. And again, as we approach the Easter long weekend, the message to all of us is clear. Stay at home this Easter and help save lives. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. What additional investments is the government making to ensure that Australia has access to all the health care needed to continue to manage the containment of the virus? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And as we are all aware, Australia isn't immune from COVID-19, but we're as well prepared as any country in the world. The government recently announced a $1.1 billion worth of initiatives, including $669 million will be provided to expand Medicare subsidised telehealth services for all Australians, with extra incentives to GPs and other health practitioners also delivered. An initial $150 million will be provided, and I commend uh, the Minister for Women and the Minister for Social Services to support Australians experiencing domestic, family and sexual violence due to the fallout of the coronavirus. An extra $74 million will be provided to support the mental health and wellbeing of all Australians. An additional $200 million will be provided to support charities and other community organisations which provide emergency and food relief as demand surges as a result of the coronavirus. And this, of course, builds on the $2.4 billion of measures Order. we've already Senator announced. Cash. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Finally, how should Australians respond to the increasing measures that are being implemented to contain the virus? Senator Cash. And as the spread of coronavirus increases in the community, it's important that Australians know the practical things that they can do to protect their own health, the health of their families and the health of the community as a whole. The Chief Medical Officer advises, as we all know, of these five simple actions, actions that we should all practice on a daily basis. Be at least 1.5 metres away from everyone, wherever this is possible. Wash your hands, do it often, and do it properly for at least 20 seconds. Cough or sneeze into your elbow, <coughs> not your hands. Do not touch your face at all, even if it itches. And if you're sick, of course, the very obvious advice, stay at home. The reason we're undertaking all of these very simple actions, though, is of course we need to work together. We need to work together to protect the elderly, to protect the vulnerable and to protect those who have lung conditions. All of our advice is that this will be for around a six-month period. Order. Senator Cash. Time Senator for Cormann. the answer has expired. Senator Cormann. Yeah. I ask that further questions be placed in an notice paper.
Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by government senators to the questions asked by Labor senators. It was only a fortnight ago that we witnessed scenes no one thought imaginable in modern First World Australia. The images beamed to us from Centrelink offices across the nation, where lines of people snaked around the block, evenly distanced at 1.5 metres apart. They were more reminiscent of wartime bread lines or depression job queues than what we would expect to see in the major cities of one of the richest countries in the world. We have been blessed with almost three decades of uninterrupted economic growth, Madam Deputy President. But for Labor's swift and decisive go hard, go early and go households response to the GFC, this uninterrupted economic growth would have ended a decade ago. But here we are. In just a few weeks, a localised coronavirus outbreak in China has morphed into a global pandemic that not only threatens the lives of potentially thousands of Australians, but also the social and political order that is the bedrock of our proud democracy. Economists are positing a question that is no longer about whether there will be a surplus or the size of a surplus or whether the surplus will be wafer thin, but rather will we avoid a depression. And that is why we are here today, to avoid that worst case scenario. Like many governments around the world, we have had to act quickly and decisively to stop the spread of the virus and protect our health systems from collapse. But in tandem with this, we've also had to scramble together plans to save the economy and, with it, the nation's workforce from falling off a cliff. Just like the GFC, that response has been to implement some good old-fashioned Keynesian economics, get the money to households, get the money to businesses and get it done quickly. If we allowed a sustained break to be created between employees and their employer, once lost, that job may never exist again. This is the theory underpinning the JobKeeper package that we are here to consider. Labor supports the government on this because Labor supports the Australian worker. We are the party of the Australian worker. It is in our DNA. Indeed, it is in our very name. The Prime Minister has said that everyone who has a job in this economy is an essential worker. And of course that is true. There is no hierarchy of importance on how we pay to put food on the table. This is why we on this side have been dismayed by firstly the Government Services Minister Stuart Robert, the member for Fadden, claiming a distributed denial of service attack on the MyGov website, and then of course having to reverse it and admit that the system had been overwhelmed, only to actually worsen that by saying it was my bad. Secondly, of course, we have been dismayed by the government's unwillingness to include various groups in the job seeker, job, sorry, job keeper package. Casuals who have been employed for under a year, workers in industries where short contracts are the norm, local government workers and various other groups. Teachers, Madam Deputy President, teachers as well, one of the most precious cohorts in this country. Across the country, casual teachers are being told that they don't have any shifts for the foreseeable future. If you're a casual teacher, you may well miss out on this package. Those teachers have been here for us throughout this virus, throughout um, the spread of it. So we should at this time be there for them. The government has the discretion to include these Australian workers in today's package. And of course, we heard in some of the answers given by government senators today that that is the case. They have the discretion to offer them the support needed to get over this unprecedented health and economic emergency. We hope that they use this discretion and put into practice a plan to uphold the words of the Prime Minister on the 24th of March. Everyone who has a job in this economy is an essential worker. Another group, of course, Madam Deputy President, who is at the coalface of vulnerability are our older Australians. And this horrible virus has shown to us that they are disproportionately affected. We will also need to have a conversation about why our native capability to manufacture 
equipment such as PPE in this country has been so severely diminished. But that perhaps is a conversation for tomorrow. We are, of course, a country Thank before you, Senator we are Kitching, an economy. Your time has expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'm very pleased to be able to make a contribution to this take note debate. Like a lot of simple pleasures that we previously took for granted, I have a new appreciation for take note. I do so as the government's nominee as deputy chair for the new Senate Select Committee to be established to scrutinise the response to COVID-19, and I want to take the opportunity of the take note today to reflect on the task of that committee and all of us as parliamentarians in the months ahead. I am honoured to be joining this committee because I'm a big believer in parliamentary scrutiny of the decisions of executive government. I particularly have great faith in the unique capacity of this chamber to provide that scrutiny. I congratulate the Chair and Deputy Chair of the Senate Standing Committee of Delegated Legislation, Senator Ferravanti Wells and Senator Carr, for their initiative to continue the important work of their committee at this time. In times of crisis, parliamentary scrutiny remains important. It is even more important given the extraordinary measures governments have been forced to put in place to respond to the coronavirus. Measures this parliament would normally never agree to have been put in place, for good reason, very rapidly. Normal parliamentary oversight, like Senate committee inquiries into proposed legislation, has not been possible in this environment where responding quickly is essential. That's why I'm pleased the Senate is establishing a Senate Select Committee to be led by Senator Gallagher to help fill that scrutiny gap, given the parliament may not have a regular sitting schedule for some time. The committee and all of us as parliamentarians have a significant task on our hands in the months ahead. The most obvious and immediate task is to examine the health measures put in place to slow the spread of the coronavirus and how effective they have been. The first duty of any government is to protect the health and safety of its citizens, and this will undoubtedly be the major focus of the committee. Many of these public health measures, implemented in conjunction with the states, have also had severe economic consequences, which we are only seeing the beginning of. It will be important for the committee to carefully consider the economic costs of these measures on the lives of ordinary Australians. And of course, that cost is not just measured in terms of dollars. We know from recessions past that lost jobs and failed businesses leave behind many human tragedies and a significant personal toll of their own. Those economic consequences have necessitated a strong fiscal response from the federal government. While the need for these fiscal measures is obvious, they represent some of the largest ever peacetime Commonwealth outlays. Meeting the cost of those outlays will be a shared national task for many years ahead, and depending on the extent and the length of the economic downturn we are all anticipating, it will potentially be an intergenerational one. As a younger member of this place, I am particularly conscious of this. The interests of taxpayers must be carefully considered by the committee, given the burden the parliament is asking them to bear today and in the years ahead. The path out of this public health crisis is understandably of great interest to all Australians. It will be appropriate to question decision makers in government and the experts who advise them about alternative pathways from here. Australians will also look to all of us for the reconstruction project ahead. Putting the economy into hibernation and starting it up again on the other side has never been tried before. The closest historical an analogies we can draw are the transitions we've made in the past from a wartime economy to a peacetime one. Once the immediate danger of the virus has passed, rebuilding our economy and public services to a degree of normalcy will be our challenge. In the longer term, we'll also have to consider questions about our national resilience and self-sufficiency. In response to the crisis so far, we have seen the suspension of normal partisanships, which defines our politics. My sense is that this has been warmly welcomed by the Australian people. Inevitably, though, there will be things on which we disagree, and that is normal and healthy in a liberal democracy. We come here informed by different values, and that is reflected in our policy preferences. We have all been required to set aside, to some degree, our political philosophy in this crisis. When the conversation returns to the post-coronavirus world, it is likely that they will re-emerge, although perhaps not in the exact form that they took in the pre-coronavirus world. The challenge for us will be to set aside the gratuitous partisanship and to explore those differences constructively in the spirit of national unity that has defined this crisis so far. That is what the Australian people expect of us. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, yes, Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam De Deputy President. Uh, we're in this chamber today as expectations on us as elected representatives has changed. Uh, in the short time that I've been a senator over the last four years, the politics as usual approach that 
certainly was the pl place in the last term of parliament, uh, can no longer cope and deal with the issues that people are confronting today. And I think it's important to note that the role the opposition has been playing has been responding to this and being constructive. I think that, as Senator Kitching said in her contribution to this, that the impact of seeing those queues outside Centrelink offices, obviously for those people directly impacted, but also for those people who observe those, uh, really uh, took home to people how uh, devastating uh, the changes that people are confronting is going to have. I know from people of my generation that have been uh, in the workforce now uh, since school for 20, 25 years and basically been employed that whole time, uh, to now find themselves uh, out of work and relying on government subsidies for the first time in their life is having a dramatic impact on those people as well. So it's really important that uh, the role of the opposition plays uh, continues to be constructive, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the work of the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, and the senior shadow ministers, particularly in uh, Health and Treasury and others, uh, Tony Burke, that have had uh, to uh, be holding the government to account, but doing it in a way where they are being constructive, which we saw through the first part of this year with the bushfires and, as we've seen, dealing with the COVID-19 emergency as well. And it's often the case that the government have got to uh, the right decision after insistence from Labor. And I think that that is an important role for us to play, where Labor has identified gaps in the health and economic response, but instead of just identifying those gaps uh, and trying to charge at the government to say they've been shortcomings, uh, what we have done is we have been constructive. Uh, so we have been constructive in the health area and we have been constructive in the economic response, uh, which is the substance of why the parliament is back here today. The Australian people are no doubt looking for outcomes. So uh, they don't want to see unnecessary political debate. Uh, they don't want to see unnecessary political arguments and game playing. Uh, they want to see a constructive approach and they can look to this parliament for guidance and hope that there is going to be the support for them when they need it, both uh, from a health point of view and from an economic point of view. But they also want to see hope for the future so that they can see the country is going to get through this and come out the other side in a stronger case. And there's no better example of the way that the Labor Party as opposition have uh, behaved during this uh, is when we talk about the job seeker package that we are here to debate today. Uh, and the government initially rejected uh, the Labor idea of a wage subsidy. Uh, and that was designed from a Labor point of view to help keep people in work. Uh, we welcome the package, but acknowledge the fact that the government have been working constructively with the union movement as well, which I think has been an important development uh, for workers in Australia. But what is disappointing is that the government can't bring themselves to bring forward a package that supports more workers. So just focusing on the requirement that the government have insisted on in regards to an a casual employer needing to be in that place, workplace for 12 months. So just looking at the ACTU data from based on ABS modelling, there are two, 215,000 Queenslanders uh, who do casual work but have been with their current employee, employer for less than 12 months. This includes 11,000 people in central Queensland. Uh, 8,300 people in Wide Bay, uh, 11, almost 11,000 people in the Moreton Bay region of Brisbane, 3,400 in Toowoomba and 82,000 people in Brisbane. So these are just some of the areas that I look after uh, in Brisbane uh, that are going to be adversely impacted because the government quite couldn't bring themselves to have that Team Australia movement that they like to talk about. Um, they like to talk about it when uh, they are setting the agenda, but they can't quite bring themselves to talk about it uh, when there are going to be people who are adversely affected because of the decision making of this government. Uh, so we will continue to pressure the government over this issue. There are a lot of people who will be adversely affected, and we need to be on thank their you, side. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I rise to participate in the take note, and I appreciate uh, the contributions that have um, occurred thus far. 
I, like Senator Kitching, um, acknowledge the images that we saw of the queues outside the Centrelink offices. I think we were all aware of uh, the impact of the decisions that were being made and uh, what would occur, but those images really brought it home that this is very much real and it's very much being felt by all of our constituents right across the country. Um, and uh, it, has, it has made us all even more aware of the importance of what we do in this place and the fact that the decisions we make here have a very real impact on people uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and that's why uh, what we're doing today, passing the JobKeeper package, is so fundamentally important because it does extend um, support to people who would otherwise be joining those queues and exacerbating the problem. And I acknowledge uh, the concerns that have been raised by the opposition regarding those who seemingly miss out, those who are missing out on the JobKeeper package. But as was stated by Senator Cash in her response to some of the questions during question time, we have to draw a line somewhere. We don't have a magic pudding of money, and we have to be as responsible as we can be fiscally and economically as we try and address this health crisis. In saying that, it is really important to note that those who do miss out on the JobKeeper package do get access to the other packages that we have put out there. The Job Seeker payment and its increased capacity is in place because we knew that there would be those who would not be ultimately eligible for other measures we consider, including the JobKeeper package. What we've done with JobKeeper is we've ensured that we've extended to casual employees who have an ongoing relationship with their employer um, and those permanently employed who have that ongoing relationship for 12 months or more, we've extended a status that's already recognised under Australia's taxation system. And so in putting together the $130 billion package, that is where we ultimately drew the line. Because when you put these lifelines in place, you have to draw a line somewhere. And as heartbreaking it is, as it is that some people will miss out, we have to be responsible. We have to remember what we are in this place to do. And we are in this place to do the best we can do for the whole of the Australian community and not individual sectors and not individual circumstances. It is impossible to individualise as much as we all may want to. Um, I also I really want to note the opportunity that we may face at the other end of, of this outbreak. I truly believe our regions will emerge stronger at the end of this. What we are seeing is our key regional industries are essential. Our agricultural industries are essential. And we need to get behind those industries to ensure they're strong at the other end. But also, our regions are very well placed to welcome back manufacturing opportunities that we once thought were lost to this nation. As was mentioned before, we can manufacture right here at home things like uh, personal protective equipment, and we do that in our regions. And I think that now is an opportunity for us to recognise that our regional Australia and agriculture is the lifeblood of this nation. And we've been through a lot. We've been through drought, we've been through bushfire, and we've had flooding in certain regions. And our regional and remote communities also rely on tourism, which has been absolutely slammed at this point. But if we get behind those industries and if we support those industries and our regions on the other side of this outbreak, we will be stronger and we will be stronger together. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator Urquhart. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Can I just begin uh, my contribution by thanking those 
on the front line. Our medical people, our paramedics, um, those working in workplaces that are actually staying open to ensure that we get the supplies we need um, and those delivering the service um, at this time. And there's many people out there working um, without the necessary personal protective equipment to keep them safe while they're doing their job to try and keep us safe. So I want to thank you to all of those people and recognise the contribution that they're making. I think um, both Senator Kitching and Senator um, Chisholm in their contribution talked about the way in which Labor has worked constructively with the government to put forward, certainly from our point of view, improvements to the legislation to ensure that not as many people fall through the cracks, or no one, hopefully, would fall through the cracks. But there still are many thousands of Australians who will miss out. <coughs> and um, earlier, I think it was earlier today, or it may have been yesterday, um, I heard the Prime Minister talk about um, cooper cooperatively working with business and unions. For us on this side, that's not a new process at all. Um, it's, our, it, it's something that we've done for years. Unions are representative of those workers that are out there on the front line. They're representative of the workers who are um, <clears throat> dealing with the um, difficulty of uh, a very worried public at the moment, um, and they should be consulted. So for us, it's not a new concept. And I hope in the future that um, discussions around all sorts of different things occur continually, both with business but also inclusive of the union movement um, through the ACTU. But I just want to talk a little bit about some of the responses that we got from the government today, and particularly those um, thousands of um, people who aren't eligible, and I think over a million, that casuals, labour hire, the nature of the industry. Um, you know, there are a, we understand that this legislation needs to get through, and I think Senator Wong, in her contribution to the ministerial statement that Senator Cormann put forward earlier, talked about the fact that we will not hold this up. But there are amendments that will help people. Um, <clears throat> and I heard Mr Porter um, the other day talk about this being our Dunkirk moment, that it was get the lifeboats out. And I guess <clears throat> one, one of the areas of concern that I have is that um, there are many Australians who are not going to get access to those lifeboats. Um, and that's why I would urge the government to, to consider the, the amendments put forward by Labor, because we do need as many people in those lifeboats as possible. Um, Minister Cash talked about those being included and that the government had to draw a line somewhere. I mean, I've been getting, as I'm sure everyone on this side and probably all of us have been getting lots of emails. We've seen the images of Centrelink. We've seen all that. Um, and I think that you know, we really need to think about the difficulties that some of those workers are going to face into the future, but not just the workers, the employers as well. When they lose employees, um, that they may not get back who have trained and, and understand their industry. There's a lot of workers in sectors, particularly labour hire, and I know from my background, the AMWU, there are uh, a lot of concern around some areas where workplaces, some workers have worked in workplaces. Shipbuildings in Tasmania is a good example that I can give you. Who there are some employees who have worked in a workplace for over 10 years, some 13 years, who have worked at the same workplace for that period of time. They've been moved on to labour hire, then the employer employs them back. They then go back to labour hire. They've been in and out of that same work uh, site, the same address. The only thing that's changed is their employer, the name of the person that employs, not their workplace, not their address of work, not their pay address, uh, not their pay rate or their classification. They come in one day employed by ex-employer. The next day they're employed by a Y employer, yet they're not eligible. That doesn't seem to make sense to me, and there's no logic in this. And I would urge the government to look at those areas, and particularly um, Senator Rustin has the ability to look at those areas, and I would urge her to do that for those long-term employees who would be considered um, casual employees in excess of 12 months' work, bar the fact that their employer has actually decided to change the method or the employer and the process of how they're actually employed.
Thank you, Senator Urquhart. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Kitching to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answer uh, given to me uh, to my question of the Leader of the Government. Um, now, we asked about the people that are left behind in the government's COVID support package and why decisions were made to leave those particular cohorts of people behind. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like we got satisfactory answers, and we will be moving amendments uh, once we come to this legislation to fill those gaps, to make sure that no one is left behind. It seems to be a phrase that's been bandied around a lot, but actually a lot of people are being left behind. Now, I asked firstly about renters. We've seen the government take action on commercial leases. But despite some early commitments a week or so ago, we've seen no actual action to protect residential tenancies. And I asked why and was told that it was a state issue. Well, commercial tenancies are technically also a state issue. So that still doesn't explain why you're leaving renters behind. And it's not clear whether or not renters might be subject to a rent increase next week or their landlords might be able to evict them once this pandemic is over. We need a national coordinated response on residential tenancies to protect renters. We need a national rent holiday. We need a national mortgage holiday. We need a national response on housing. Surely that is the most fundamental task of government, to ensure that people have a roof over their heads. Now, there's some power, um, discretionary power that will be granted to various ministers, and we will continue to urge those powers to be used to protect people, to keep them safe at home, and to ensure that landlords can't increase rent or boot people out onto the streets. Now, I asked also about why casuals have been left behind if they've not been employed for that one year time frame. I asked why, why the one year, why this arbitrary distinction between people in precarious and casual work, um, wh why draw that line? What's the justification? Now, it's very telling that of the uh, one million people who are casuals that will miss out on JobKeeper because they haven't been an employee for one year, half of those are young people, half of them are under 24. So they're also facing those other precarious rental um, and insecure income situations. They're already struggling with the realities of everyday life that has left young people behind for so long. And now they're facing this added insult of being left out of the JobKeeper package. I'm afraid I didn't feel like I received a, um, a, a really a response as to why that line was drawn. Reference was made to the Fair Work Act. Well, you're still leaving a million people behind and half of them, half a million people, are young people. So we will continue to campaign for casual workers, um, all casual workers, to be eligible to receive that JobKeeper allowance. Now, I lastly asked about the increased costs for disabled people and their carers um, and why they haven't been um, topped up to the rate of, of JobSeeker. And we were told that, well, this is because they used to get paid more than the old rate of New Start. And they've had a few increases. I think there's been two that we were, we were informed of. But sadly, those increases still don't see disabled people or those on carer payments receiving the same amount as the new job seeker amount. And yet, these folk are facing increased costs. The burden of self-isolation is increasing their costs. We've had um, stories shared with us. People that used to be able to catch public transport now can't take the risk. They're immune suppressed, a whole variety of other reasons. The cost of transport has increased for them, and yet they're now getting less than others in a comparable situation. So, again, we don't want to see anybody left behind, and we want those words to mean something when they're used by the big parties in this parliament. We will be moving amendments so that renters are not left behind, people with disabilities and their carers are not left behind, casual workers, irrespective of how long they've worked, are not left behind. We'll also be moving amendments to protect uh, people and residents who are temporary workers, who are migrant workers, who are uh, visa workers who are being left out of this support system for no good reason. 
We'll also be moving to protect international students and, crucially, people in the arts and entertainment sector that are providing us with such joy and reflection in these times of self-isolation. They do not deserve to be left behind. Nobody does. We can fix these things later today, and we will be moving to ensure that this parliament does just that. Thank you, Senator Waters. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.